So welcome everyone. You are at the April 12th, 2024 Preparing to Bid series uh, workshop on graffiti removal services. My name is Tiffany Scroggs and I'll be facilitating today's discussion. And I'm glad that you're here. We have a, a good uh, group on the line today interested in learning more about this solicitation. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Um, we are hoping this is interactive, so feel free to unmute and ask questions or put them in the chat. I try and monitor that as I go. Or Lisa Lagerstrom, who's here today helping out, will interrupt me with the question. Um, and then later on, we're going to have kind of an interactive discussion about the solicitation itself. So if you want to go ahead and pull up the solicitation and get that ready, you're welcome to do that. You're invited to do that. So today we're going to just talk about why we're here. We're going to talk about uh, who I am and where I work. We'll talk about the solicitation history and we'll review the opportunity and we'll get right into it. It'll be a lot of fun. We'll um, explore two tools that you can use in your business, the pre-bid checklist and the bid or no bid decision matrix. And then we'll talk about resources to keep you going throughout, uh, even after today's one hour session. So the Apex Accelerator is a program of a nonprofit organization called the Thurston Economic Development Council, and we're funded by the federal government to help businesses navigate government contracts. We wanna see more government contracts awarded to businesses here in Washington. And we have a focus on serving small businesses, minority women, and veteran owned firms. We have 17 advisors at six different locations across the state, and we provide the no-cost advising services and training, and our clients are awesome. Last year, it says on here they won $300 million in contracts and subcontracts. I just pulled it for this last year, and it was actually $600 million. So our clients are awesome. We hope to be able to work with you even after this training. This is our team across the state. Um, don't, don't feel bad about writing it down or uh, digesting this map. Um, really the most important part is the washingtonapex.org email and web address down at the bottom where you can just email and be like, hey, I need help. Or you can um, go to our website and click on become a client. So, okay, the fun part, let's get going here. Solicitation history. So Washington State Department of Enterprise Services manages what are called statewide contracts with over 1,500 businesses, they called vendors, and almost $2 billion in annual spend. So a lot of money goes through these statewide contracts. State agencies and local governments use the statewide contracts to buy commonly purchased goods and services. Uh, in, in doing business as the central procurement office for the state, they do a lot of market research to determine, you know, what uh, what is what are agencies buying a lot of that we might be able to put on a statewide contract that would make their lives easier. Um, and graffiti removal must have rose to the top of that list because here we are with a brand new shiny contract for Washington State. And so agencies that, um, of course, are within Washington State or local jurisdictions or higher ed education institutions like um, community colleges can use the statewide contracts to get what it is they need. And so we'll talk a little bit more about how to find the statewide contracts that exist now and that, that history. <clears throat> but first, let's talk a little bit about, well, if this is a brand new contract, how does state agencies and local governments get uh, graffiti removal services now? How do they buy that? And they, they buy it in a number of ways. Um, one of the ways is through the statewide small works roster through MRSC and bonus points if you notice my typo there. Um, MRSC manages the small works roster for a lot of agencies, not all the agencies, but a lot of them. And there is categories on there for graffiti removal, for power washing and for painting. Uh, agencies also might set up their own small works roster and um, get people pre-approved or businesses pre-approved on that. And then they go shopping on there for what it is they need in terms of painting or power washing. And then they also might have a competitive bid for like on-call services or just a contract. Like, hey, come on out and clear out this graffiti every month um, and give us your amount. And we, um, I've pulled a couple of samples of those types of contracts just for my own um, understanding. I'm happy to, to share what I've found. But if, for those of you who have been in this industry for a while, you might already be doing business through uh, government agencies, through one of these 
ways, or maybe they just called you up and they said, you know, hey, we got graffiti over here, come help us out. Uh, because it was a low enough dollar amount that it didn't require competition. So all sorts of ways that agencies are getting this service now. And the reason I spent a little time on this is that uh, when graffiti removal statewide contract is, is um, awarded and available for agencies to use, it's going to take a while for them to change their habits. So um, the state agencies will be mandated to use the new contract, but the state and local will not be mandated. They can choose to if they want. So um, just keep that in mind that there is a marketing piece to this. Once you're on a contract, you wanna promote the fact that you're on that contract and spend some time and create a strategy around that. And so uh, we can talk further on that one-on-one, uh, -on -one, kind of what a best strategy is for your business, but I wanna highlight that right off the bat. Uh, because, pop quiz, once you're on a statewide contract, is there any guarantee you will get an award? You can unmute and yell it out, or you can put it in the chat. Is there any guarantee you'll get work after winning this contract? Dan gets the gold star today. Thank you, Dan. The answer is no, there's no guarantee. Thanks, Dan. All right, so what will happen after award? I actually found this uh, nice little graph uh, from the contract itself. They provided in the solicitation notice a sample contract for your review that includes all sorts of fun things like insurance requirements. And it includes this. So what will happen after the award? The contract, um, which provides the common terms and conditions for eligible purchasers, um, will be created. And then the purchaser, so that state agency or the local government, will issue a project-specific work request to the awarded contractors. So if there's eight awardees, they'll issue them to the eight. Um, I think there's fewer than that. So that was a bad example, but, and then the contractor will provide a quote, that's you. You will respond with that and say, hey, I could do it for X amount of dollars. And then uh, if they like what they see, the, the, pur the purchaser, the government agency will issue the order, the purchase order, and then you'll perform the work. So we will be working directly with the government entities that need the service. So say, hypothetically, the University of Washington needs graffiti abatement. We would then be working with them to establish a purchase order and scheduling and coordination and all of that. Yes. So, um, yeah, that, I think I understood the question. Yeah. If University of Washington wanted to use this contract, they would issue the the work request, the contractors would provide a quote, and then they would pick their favorite quote, probably based on price. And then um, and then the contract would come after the fact, and then you would perform, and then you get paid. Okay, cool. Thanks for that clarity. I love it when people interject. Thank you. So on the website, I gave like the full write out link, even though it's not pretty. I mean, you'll, you have a copy of these slides, so you can follow along if you'd like. This is what it looks like on the des.wa.gov website for graffiti removal services. And it, it's the it's the landing page for this particular contract. So it has a contract number, it has a, a quick descri um, description, and then it has the effective date, which says 9 to 2024. So they're hoping to award and have it be in effect by September 2nd. And it looks like it goes for three years and they're expecting an estimated annual worth of 2.5 million. So that's a lot of graffiti. Um, I would imagine that it might take them a little while to ramp up to that annual worth. That first year is not gonna be near that. Um, it is Tiffany's prediction <laughs> for what it's worth. Uh, historical spend. So. Uh, this is a new solicitation, but you might be able to see who the state has purchased from in the past. Um, you can go to the open checkbook, which we've provided the link there, and type in your competitor's name um, and see if, if they're winning work, or you can kind of uh, take a look at those and see uh, if there's anything in there that's somewhat helpful. Some of the data is a little bit uh, lacking. It's kind of high-level data, which may or may not be helpful. Uh, there is a data.wa um poll that we could do with you if, you if you get stuck in there and happy to take a look at that. I did a quick search and I didn't see anything that was super useful, but I wanted to highlight the fact that 
public contracting is public. It is uh, taxpayer paid for. And so therefore it's our business who the government's buying services from and how much they paid for it. So it's not unusual to be able to see the solicitation, the, um, the winning bidders bid, or even a bid tab of kind of the ranking of all of the pricing that came in. And then the, the final contract after the fact, that is public information that you and I can go try and find either through a website or through a public disclosure request or some other way. So um, now is the time to start digging around for that. If, if you're interested, uh, your Apex Accelerator Advisor would be happy to, to work with you on that further. So let's talk about the current opportunity. So I think many of you have registered in webs and are able to log in at no cost and see the solicitation. Uh, I wanna really foot stomp and highlight that WEBS is the only authoritative source for this solicitation. So if, if I say something or I email you or OMWBE says something or you find it on the OMWBE website or some other website, that doesn't count. That is not official information. Uh, so the only authoritative source is the Department of Enterprise Services, is the contract specialist, um, Gideon. So, uh, Gideon is the only person that has the authority to say anything definitive about this contract. So just keep that in mind. Um, your questions will go to Gideon. Your um, answers will come from him in the form of an amendment that everyone else can see. So it's a very formal process and that's designed to make sure that it's fair for everyone competing on it. The other thing I wanna mention on this page is the commodity codes. So your Web's profile should include commodity codes that are relevant to what it is you do. And we know that selecting commodity codes can be a rather tedious task because there are a lot of them. And so um, in order to try and ensure adequate competition, Gideon has hopped in here and put in a lot of different commodity codes. And now's an excellent time to pull that full list and add all of them to your profile. And that not only makes sure that you're kind of in tune with this particular solicitation and getting notified about it, but also future ones that might come up that are somewhat related. So um, that commodity code list can be really helpful. The third thing you wanna check is that you're getting emails from webs and they're not going to your spam folder or somewhere else. So if you found out about this opportunity from somewhere other than an email from webs, uh, then you need to double check your profile and make sure your registration is all clean and ready to go. I'll give a shout out to the Web's customer service team. They're phenomenal. They answer the phone when you call and Joe on the other side is just super eager and, and helpful. So if you have any questions on Web's and getting in there, you can ask your Apex and you can also just call the, call the number on the Web's help desk. So the current opportunity, if you scroll down within Web's, you can see the vendors that have downloaded it. And maybe some of you recognize your name on this list. Um, you, when you download it, you can go back and see if your name is on there and whether or not you're correctly listed as a small business. And as we'll get to later, it's really important that you are correctly listed because there's reserved awards for small businesses and for veteran owned certified businesses. So um, you can see the status on the right hand side. And then I've added the legend of what the MC is, what M-MC is. Um, so you can take a look at that. This is what my profile looks like inside webs. Um, I kept mentioning, you know, make sure your profile's up to date. I wanted to just show you where to get there. So on the left-hand side within webs, it's a pretty simple system. It's hard to, hard to get lost. You can go ahead and click on manage profile and take a look and make sure everything is totally up to date and ready to rock uh, and that your status is accurate. So I've circled there the um, OMWB slash veteran slash Washington small. So here's um, at the very bottom of the web's opportunity are the attachments, which is where all the fun is. So the solicitation documents are there and then the amendments will start to pop up on the right hand side. There will be amendments, I guarantee it, because um, if you submit a question, they will be um, answered in the form of an amendment. And there's always questions. Uh, there also might be more uh, important amendments that actually change maybe factors of the award or due dates or 
some other important element that you want to make sure that you pay attention to. So your task is to read and understand all the documents and beware of embedded or linked documents within the documents. And I know that that can look really overwhelming, but that's why we're here today is to kind of just dissect this RFP, this request for proposal, kind of, and make it a little less daunting. Like, oh, you want me to like click and save and download and print and look at all these things, right? So let's just dive in uh, one at a time and take a look. And this is the interactivity portion is coming up. So if you don't mind opening up that competitive solicitation, which is the second document there, the, the Word document, uh, we're going to ask you to help me out here in a minute. So um, before we go there, let's zoom out a little bit and talk about what we're doing here. So this is the process to award. So you're gonna read the solicitation documents with particular interest to the solicitation document that I just mentioned and exhibit B. Um, and I think it's B1 and two, depending on, on the service and then decide whether or not to bid. That is a decision that you can and need to make. And then you're gonna organize your approach. You're gonna assemble the bid and submit and then wait <laughs> and hopefully uh, see if you're the the um, apparent successful bidder after a certain amount of time. So we're going to uh, take a closer look at that first little arrow, the reading the solicitation documents. This is a tool that we've developed for our small business clients to um, to get you started on how to dissect a proposal document like this. Um, it doesn't read like a beautiful novel that kind of guides the reader in a in a seamless way. It uh, it's a legal document, and so it reads like a legal document. And so, at least my eyes tend to glaze over. They tend to be like, well, you know, I'm thinking, why is this relevant? What is this even saying? And so, I use a pre proposal checklist even now, and I've been at this for 15 years. So I I pull up a pre proposal checklist that has the checklist item and I kind of treat it like a little bit of a scavenger hunt. Uh, and so I, I, as I'm reading the solicitation, I have my highlighter out and I'm looking for the answers to what the important thing is on my checklist. So the checklist we gave you is in Word with, um, and the reason we gave it to you in a Word doc is so that you could edit it to your content. You could make it your own. You could delete things that are irrelevant. You can add things that are super relevant and you can kind of change the formatting, whatever works for you. This is your tool. So uh, it's a pretty generic checklist as we'll, as we'll find out and it may or may not include things that are relevant. So uh, let's start at the very top though. The solicitation review check sheet for solicitation number and that's blank. What solicitation is this? What's the number? Does anyone wanna help me out here? Unmute or type it in. What's the number? Two five four two three. Oh, good one. Awesome. Two five four two three. So that's an important number. That's the number on webs. That's the number on the document. That's probably what your email communications to the contract specialist will include in the subject line because the DES employees, they buy lots of things and they want to keep it all the same. So two five four three two. I'm sorry, you got it right. Uh what's the deadline to submit? Anyone find that yet? June 4th. June 4th, 2024. Perfect. And where did you find that? Do you know what page? Page six of Perfect. the solicitation. Yep. Exactly. So I always forget where I saw something. <laughs> so I have to go back and if I want to read it again, I want to see where I wrote that down, where I found it. So the, and there's a pre-proposal conference date, it's called a pre-bid. And if you're on that page, you probably saw it's April 16th at 2 p.m. It's uh, via a, a Teams link, I think. And that's also found on that same kind of um, box on there on page five, just slightly ahead of the, the due date. That's an optional pre-bid conference. Uh, sometimes they're mandatory. So you really wanna flag that right up front because if you miss that and it's mandatory, you're out. Now, this one is optional. Uh, site visit date is, again, this is a generic checklist that you can make your own. There is no site visit. 
for this, um, but there might be for your industry in the future. So uh, you can just put a big old NA on that one and, um, and move on. There's a pre-proposal inquiry, which is a fancy word for question and answers um, between now and May 25th. So a nice big chunk of time that allows you to uh, really dive in and get all your questions answered ahead of time. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of getting your questions answered or, if, or identifying complaints about the solicitation if you have any or barriers to your participation now. Um, <clears throat> because uh, a lot of times businesses are like, well, I don't know, you know, this is a pretty big barrier to me competing on it. I'm just going to walk away or, well, I'm going to put my name in the hat anyway and see how I do. And then what happens is um, they don't win and then they try and protest and like, well, you didn't tell us that during the Q&A period or the complaint period. So sorry. And so uh, now's the time. Bring it up to DES if you find any barriers with your participation in this uh, competitive opportunity. The issue date is there too. So page five and six have a lot of core information that you want to flag. Did anyone see where in the solicitation it talks about reserved awards? Give folks a second if you're looking through it. And if you have it on your computer, you can control F type in the it's, word reserved. It's on page two. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and that's really important. If you, regardless of your size or your veteran owned business status, uh, we want to make sure that you understand the how they're going to be awarding this. So there are reserved awards, meaning those awards are only eligible for firms that meet that criteria. There is a, a standard award too, um, but we want to make sure that you understand that. And then we, we know the commodity codes and all of that. Let's go to the next page of the checklist. Talks about the method of proposal submission. So you're going to email it. It's going to be unzipped. And it's going to be smallish. 25 megabytes is actually still pretty large. And that's found on page 14. That trips up a lot of firms. They're like, how do I submit this? Do I submit it in webs? I don't see the link. <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's not really what webs is for. So yeah, you have to email it to the contracting specialist. Can you repeat, you were going to say you can find something if you push control F? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Super fun trick. Um, if, if you have the document open on your computer, you can hit control F and up will pop a search function and you can search for any of these terms. Reserved is probably what I would search to find the reserved award or just even small business would be a term that you could search. Uh, and that saves you a lot of time. I like printing things out and using my highlighter and being kind of tactile with it. Um, but then I also have it on my computer and I do a control F on a lot of terms and it, it saves you a ton of time from having to really flip through all the pages to find stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So how are they going to evaluate you? So, and I know this, um, you don't have, you haven't had time to really fully dive into the solicitation probably, but on page nine, it talks about how you're gonna be evaluated. And it looks like non-cost factors are 400 points and cost is 550 points. So it's gonna be more important that you're a lower bidder um, in order to get maximum points. And then um, there's a lot of uh, what they call executive, or there is one executive order um, by the governor and it's executive order 18-03 and it has to do with recycled stuff and nasty chemicals and whatnot. I haven't, I don't actually know a lot about it, but you get 50 points if you're in compliance with the governor's executive order. Um, and if you have, it should be linking you directly from the solicitation to that executive order. And if not, we can help you find that. Uh, okay. So this type of contract is also really important because if I'm bidding something, I want to know, uh, you know, I know the term, right? Because I saw that earlier. It's a couple, two years or three years. But when can I adjust my pricing? You know, what if the cost of paint skyrockets? What if transportation costs skyrocket? Will I be able to go and, and get um, a price adjustment, an economic adjustment for those increased prices? What's my risk? And so um, normally 
you would find in the contract document, which is exhibit D on page four, you would normally see the economic price adjustment. It's, it's missing and I don't know why. And so that's one of the questions that I might ask during the Q&A period, or I encourage you to ask is, uh, is there an opportunity to increase pricing over time? Questions on that? Okay, if you find the economic price adjustment clause, let me know, because I missed it. I read the whole thing and I can't find it. And then, okay, so, um, and then there's, a, the checklist goes on. So you can, again, make that Word document your own, um, use it as a tool at least one time in your life <laughs> on this solicitation. And if it doesn't work for your brain, then, then you know, adapt it to, to your needs so that it does work. But like I said before, reading the solicitation from top to bottom and then all the attachments from top to bottom is just daunting for anyone's brain. It just doesn't flow very well. And so um, having a checklist of what you're looking for as you read through the documents is really helpful. And I think also um, having a notes section and having a question section like uh, that you can kind of uncover questions as you go is also really important. So let's move on to the bid or no bid tool. So we have the checklist tool, which you have. We also gave you a bid or no bid tool. And the idea is, and this could take, um, you know, 10 minutes if you're a small firm and you, you have one person in your company, or, or maybe it'd take a day or two or three if you're a larger company. Um, you know, we work with some pretty sophisticated larger defense primes, for example, that, that may take a couple of weeks to decide to bid or not. Uh, but for this solicitation, and I would imagine it's kind of a, a quicker process. But we do encourage you to just stop for a second and conduct a bid, no bid analysis based on your company's goals, what you're good at, and your likelihood for success because small businesses do not have the luxury of bidding on a lot of things. So it forces you to slow down, read the solicitation, understand it, challenge your own assumptions about what's probably in there, um, and allows you space to think about why you want this work and how you'll bid competitively, which will inform your strategy. We want you to strategize on the best way to win this work. So this is what it looks like. And the first question is related to, can we bid? You know, can I meet the technical requirements? Uh, can we meet the schedule requirements? Do I understand the risk? Um, and it kind of walks you through a lot of key questions and you might not know the answers to all of these. Uh, right off the bat, but that's where you kind of highlight it and try and figure out a way to find those answers. So one of those questions is um, related to cash flow. Uh, do we have a steady cash flow to cover expenses for the duration of the project? So that involves going to understand the payment terms. When am I going to get paid on this work? How long will that take? And um, and so there's there's work to be done there reading the solicitation. And if you can't answer these questions, you have a couple of options. You can ask the contracting officer, you can brainstorm with your APEX advisor, um, or uh, talk to your other colleagues or coworkers or paint suppliers or whoever you work with that might help you uncover kind of uh, some of these questions. And the idea is that it's not a um, emotional response to can we bid? Like, of course we can, right? I'm an entrepreneur, I can do anything I want. It's more of a, um, a calculated decision. So that first line, can we meet the technical requirements that you've read the exhibit B and you understand all the requirements, you might give yourself a five or a four if you can do it, or you might give yourself a two or a one if like, nope. Um, and then it adds it up at the bottom. The next section after can we bid is do we want to bid? So is it core to your business or is graffiti removal just something you do on the side? because you you do building maintenance and this is like one offshoot thing that you do sometimes. Um, is there additional work after this program? This program refers to like the contract mechanism and um, maybe, maybe not. I mean, this is a statewide contract that could be used by all state agencies and could be used by higher ed and other jurisdictions across the state. Can you be profitable? Um, 
have you worked with this customer? It's like, do you want, do you want to bid? It's always just a question to ask yourself. We worked with a lot of janitorial firms and, and they took a hard, if they had done the janitorial work with the state before the new contract came out this last time, they were like, I don't, I don't know that I want to do business with the state. That contract was brutal. It squeezed us down and we didn't make any money. And it was, uh, it took a lot of staff time, that kind of thing. And they, they ended up revising the contract to be a little bit better, but um, we had a lot of businesses we were talking to that were like, yeah, I, you know, I don't know if I'm going to score myself a five or a four on this. Um, and it kind of, you know, they, they took time at least to ask themselves that question. Okay. Um, so we're back zoomed out. So um, theoretically, you you're going to read all the documents that are in there. You're going to use your checklist to kind of help make sure you don't glaze over while you're reading it. Um, you're going to really hone in on the exhibit B's because the exhibit B is really the, the task at hand for both the pressure washing and the painting. Um, and then you're going to decide whether or not to bid. You're going to organize your approach and make sure all your questions get answered by the authoritative source, which is Department of Enterprise Services. You're going to assemble a bid and hopefully submit and, and you shall submit on time. There's no missing that deadline. That is firm. I do have a question. Please. If we are already executing graffiti removal services, uh, painting and pressure washing and using um, eco-friendly chemicals, can we apply for both? Uh, both categories? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And normally I would answer your question and give you the source of how I knew that, but I, I don't know how I know that other than... Um, I read it in the instructions for the, I think it was the pricing actually. And maybe uh, when we get to the Q and A, I can pull it up and show you where that's at. But each, that pricing document is gonna have a couple of tabs for each, for the pressure washing and for the painting and then an instructions tab. And I'm pretty sure that's where I read it. But yes, absolutely. They want you to um, be a full, um, I actually, I wonder why they even have the two categories because it's, I guess I don't know much about graffiti removal, but I th I thought maybe you would pressure wash it first and then paint over what couldn't be pressure washed off. So maybe I don't. So I don't know. Is that is that how that works? No, okay. two okay. different methodologies. But oh, is it? It's either or. Okay. And I, and then the question comes in like, what about? Is there a third methodology? Is there a third way? that the state might not even have thought about. And now would be an excellent time to bring that up to them. Okay, so top tips. Um, before we really dive into Q&A and maybe even pull up the documents and take a look. So ask questions yeah. and identify barriers now, and then ask for a debrief. So a debrief is a formal process that happens after the solicitation process is over and they announce the awardees you have a certain amount of days very quickly to ask for a debrief to find out what what went well with your solicitation, what you need to work on. And that is key to learning how to do better in the future. Um, so I recommend a debrief regardless of whether or not you win. If you didn't win, see if any of the successful contracts contractors need subs or target agencies who aren't mandated to use the statewide contract. And, um, and there's plenty of work out there and we can brainstorm with you how to do that. Uh, you wanna double check that you're in, in state small webs business and we can talk to you can about that. Can we talk about the water? Oh, hey, Michael, go ahead. Yeah, hi, can we talk about the water? Um, how do we do with the water from the water that is fresh washing from the, from the break? What do we do with that water? Well, I don't know. You mean on the job site itself? You're right. Oh, and what to do uh, to contain the water? You're right. No, I have no idea. I'm so sorry. I don't know anything about environmental containment. Because that's a place they say something about the water, but I was just going to scan to find out. But there's a place I find out and talk about the, you know, um, what you do with the water coming out and how yeah. do you protect the water and or how do you treat yeah. the water. Great question. And I, don't even know where to start with that other than I would imagine labor and industries or even um, 
what's the, the not the EPA on the state side, but the Department of Ecology might have something to say about that. Um, so I, I don't know. We'd have to take the waste, that off. the waste management. Oh, I don't know. They're not really a regulatory agency, though, right? It's going to be the the regulatory agencies are Labor and Industries and Department of Ecology, and they're going to be the ones that are going to be making sure you're not killing fish, right? <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Good, good question, though, that, you know, we're, um, Lisa and I, we're really good at how government buys stuff and helping position your firm for success, not necessarily how to do the actual work. Clearly, I know nothing about graffiti, <laughs> so or pressure washing or anything. So, um, but we maybe we can connect you to the people who do know. Um, nice. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Tip five is get certified as a a public works small business, which is a brand new certification. It launched yesterday. And um, I've been told by two clients that um, if you are already certified with the Office of Minority and Women Business Enterprises, getting the public works certification for your small business is easy as pie, 15 minutes. So Go check it out if you're already certified. If you're not already certified, it's a little bit longer, but not too bad. It's it's designed to be quick and easy and you get certified there and then get on the, the roster, the small works roster. I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, how are agencies buying this now? Um, prior to the statewide contract, a lot of them are using uh, the, like the DES roster or they're, um, or they're using the, the local governments for sure are using the small works roster. And so, um, get certified now and in July they'll be able to direct award um through the small works roster. So um anyway, lots of changes there. This this webinar is not about MRSC or how to get in as a small works vendor on their roster, but I wanted to make sure that that was added as a top tip because that is definitely where your firm should be uh right now for other work outside of this contract. Uh, the other consulting it, that's happening throughout the state is with Golden Gift. I don't know, is Veronica or Ryan on the line by chance? You want to say no, hi? No, neither are oh, there. Okay, no. okay bummer. So um, they're also a, a resource provider through Department of Enterprise Services offering no-cost advising on how to uh, bid and win state contracts like this one. And so you can call or email Ryan there and he'll connect you to Veronica probably. Um, and then I think Tabor 100 is another name you might see. I didn't see that they had any events any coming up. Did you, Lisa? So I, I didn't have their slide in here, but keep an eye out for an event from Tabor on this solicitation as well. And then this is my contact information with my website. And uh, if you're not in Washington, uh, we would gladly introduce you to our colleagues across the state lines. There's an Apex Accelerator in every state in the union. Um, and I also recommend everybody subscribe to our newsletter. So with that, I welcome your questions. Let's let's do q and I'm going to stop sharing so I can see your pretty faces. Go ahead. Stephanie, this is Shana. Can you hear oh, me? Hey. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? Hey, good. I wanted to mention that we are going to be having two workshops for paint and painting services and graffiti removal. One is going to be at Tabor 100 on April 24th, and that will be in person. And the other one will be virtual, and it will be April 25th. The one on the 25th will be virtual. It will start at 4 o'clock, and we're going to cover paint, painting services and graffiti removal. And those um, one that's in person at Tabor will be starting about 5.30. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was the information I didn't have yesterday when I prepared my slides. So thanks for sharing that. And we can Sorry add about that. that. Yeah. Oh, no problem. We can add it to our follow-up email with links yep. on half register. We'll do that. Oh, great. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll send you a flyer. Um, the other thing is we have, other, we have two other consultants working on the, these two contracts. Okay. Um, one is Next Consulting and the other is Song Consulting. And I'll oh, send okay. you those information, that information too. Great. And, and Golden Gift is one of them too? Yeah, they're working on painting though, not graffiti removal. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, let's talk about that for a second. So um, 
So right now there's a statewide solicitation out for graffiti removal. That's the one we're talking about today. There is also mm -hmm. a statewide solicitation out for painting services and the paint. So um, if you are a primarily painting company, you would probably want to pursue both of these. And we can um, link you to the recording of the painting, you know, RFP and all that, all that fun stuff um, as well. And then Lisa asked me to repeat or asked Shana to repeat that Tabor painting information. So Tabor 100 is a nonprofit in Tequila and they're right where I-5 and 405 connect. And they have a lot of in-person meetings uh, similar to this, but probably deeper dive. What they're going to do on April 24th at 530 in person is uh, is sit around a table and kind of deep dive into this solicitation. So um, you can ask a lot of questions. You can um, kind of hash out a strategy right there in person. And then on April 25th, for those who don't want to go to Tequila, that'll be held virtually. So it'll be um, kind of like this is the high level to get you ready for the pre-bid conference coming up uh, next week. And then that's a little bit more in depth when you've got your questions more refined and you're really ready to dive in. Is that fair, Shana? Did I miss anything? No, good recap. No, that's a yep. Okay, perfect. All right, so what other questions do you have? If um, while you're thinking of them and unmuting and asking them, I'm gonna um, pull over the Excel file for exhibit C, just to take a look at that. So this is one of the exhibits that was in that long list of exhibits and it's the bid price exhibit. And I think my screen is sharing. Okay, so it looks like bidders will input their percent markup of the cells and bidders may bid on any or all specified contract categories and geographic areas. There's your answer there, perfect. I was going to ask, were the two consulting companies able to be shared in the chat or, or where can we get that information? Yeah, we can definitely pull up Song. Who was the other one? Um, Next Consulting. I'm going to send, if you registered and didn't just jump on um, this link without registering, then I have your email address um, and I will be sending out information on Next Consulting. Shana said she would send some information over and we'll share with you. And then Young Sang Song is also another consultant that's working on graffiti removal. And it will go in an email to you all. Let me see if I can grab it also yeah. and put it in chat. Perfect. Yeah. Um, while you're doing that, I just want to pull up Exhibit D. So this is another one. A lot of a lot of firms skip Exhibit D because it's like, yeah, yeah, that's the contract. Um and you might skim it and miss some kind of important things. So I always recommend that firms do take a really close look at this. This is going to be your contract if you bid and win. So um, of course, it's it's just the it's the first draft. It even says draft in the title. So it's not necessarily final, but uh, it's rare that major things get changed after the fact. So I just want to highlight this and then I watch your eyes. I'm going to, are you, am I sharing? Oh, good. I'm going to scroll all yes. the way down. Sorry if this is making you do, 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 to uh, the insurance exhibit. Where did it go? Hold on. Control there. F. I should have controlled F. That would have been more efficient. I knew I knew where it was. It was Exhibit C, insurance <laughs> requirements. So, um, you know, cut and paste this, send it to your insurance provider, and you can do this right now and see if um, if you are currently insured at these levels or, and what it's going to cost you to, to get up to these requirements. And if they're a barrier, you can always ask the state to pretty please consider them, lowering them or changing the insurance requirements. Sometimes they do, and most of the time they don't, but it doesn't hurt to ask. All right, what other questions do you have? I got a question, Dan here with Dash Distribution and Sales. Hi, Dan. Um, hi, we have uh, exclusive sales and distribution rights to EcoCrete Penetrating Concrete Sealant, which in this application, it would be the pressure washer that once the task is complete, they would apply this and it would 
strengthen, harden, and densify the concrete, and also help provide protection from future um, tagging, graffiti, stains, whatever the case is. Does this request spe specify calling in treating the concrete, or is that something that could be a change? How do mm -hmm. I get It'd be best done by the pressure washer, not the company applying the paint. Okay. Unless it's the same company, of course. Yes, thank you. So um, great question and excellent time to get into this game. This okay. is exhibit B, let's see. I don't know offhand. Um, While you're pulling that up, it's worth noting that the product brand itself, its ownership is minority veteran owned. And myself, the sales and distribution company is service disabled veteran owned. Great. Um, so we check a few boxes. Let's see. So I'm looking to see, this is all better compliance. It's yes or no. Um, and I'm not seeing anything like bitter will coat the concrete after washing. <laughs> that would be Hold on and, and see, or six rather, correct application of pressure and any chemicals used in pressure washing. Um, I got to move the gallery. Yep. Process. So that one is more about kind of what Michael was saying with, um, Product, it's that last part. Products used shall be green seal certified. Uh, I just saw the word seal. So okay, that yeah. triggered my thinking. But yep. um, and, and it is that, in fact, it is that. So it would be that after washing application to treat the, the substrate itself. Okay. Prior and here's that that would be a great, that would be a great question to put in writing and mm -hmm. submit to the yep. care coordinator. So it, amendment number one. Or even <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or even when you attend the pre-bid, asking that question. Great question. Yeah. yeah a lot of times okay. I've been sending questions in prior to the pre-bid to give them a heads up in the hopes that they if they need to do research before they get before they show up, they're a little bit prepared. But either way, mm -hmm. yes. Um exactly because um, again, I'm not an authoritative short source. Shana works for DES and she's not the contract specialist on here. So we all, we all want to direct you to Gideon and, and ask your question formally and get it answered. And that might be something that is such a best practice that they maybe make a requirement to the solicitation because I'm not seeing it here, but if firms were doing that on a consistent basis, it would raise their pricing. So now you have firms that are doing it and some that aren't, and that's not really apples to apples. So yes. also raises the value extensively. Yeah. Okay. And and Lisa is very excited with her red highlighter here. I am <laughs> showing about the stormwater pollution prevention plan. Uh, and it was Department of Ecology. So it looks like um you shall prepare and implement a plan. And there's a link to the permit right there. Thank you for that. What other questions do people have? For anybody that has, like I had mentioned, if you had not registered formally, but you got this link from somebody and you showed up, because we have seven people that just showed up, um, I don't have your emails, so if you're one of those folks, um, if you can just put your email in the chat, I will make sure you get the follow-up information on the other consultants that can help with this, which would be Next Consulting and Young Sangsong. So I will keep that information and make sure you get a follow-up. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions. We will definitely stay on for a few minutes. Go really ahead. quick. Um, so this is, you're bidding this to get the opportunity to bid it again, because all these jobs are going to come out to the public to bid, right? Uh, um, not quite the public. Let me share my or, screen. Or I guess just who qualifies or whatever, but basically you're, this is like, I'm not really, I'm, maybe you explained it, but maybe not, uh. This is a contract for the opportunity to bid again, or yes, essentially, you're you're getting an opportunity to be considered 
um, after that. So they're pre-vetting you to get you on this contract to limit the bidding pool later on for the agencies who want to buy from you. So um, does anyone know offhand how many awards they're doing per region? Is it two or four, something like that? Um, you would be competing against that little pool for the purchaser work request. And a lot of times what we see is that firms get on contract and they get really busy and they might not respond to the purchaser work request in a timely way. So then it even limits it further, but yet you're absolutely right. This is your, your, your ability to be considered. And if you're not on the statewide contract, then you're not being considered for the agencies that are going there to buy this service. On pages the agencies like the agencies don't have to go to this. They could still do it as they do it now, and you know, submit it through like MSRC or whatever, MRSC. Um, yes, agencies. Way, right? Agencies are mandated to go to statewide contracts first, unless they have a reason not to. Shana, do you want to um, talk a little bit further about that? Yeah, M MRSC is really specifically for public works projects. Um, this is not per se a public works. This is a goods and services project. So um, per the law, all state agencies must use our statewide contract. So if you're awarded on the contract, um, our agencies have to use that first unless they have a very, very good reason not to. And the prices that you bid at are generally the prices they expect to um, be used when they have a project. Um, so, so thanks, Shana. I want to I want to point out though. You said it wasn't public works, but prevailing wage is a requirement, so that it's not skirting the prevailing wage requirement. True, true, and it's prevailing wage because you've got a public agency paying. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I think, um, MRSC will still exist and will still have graffiti removal as a category. So, um, I guess I'm not, I'm not sure, uh, I guess the local governments will have a choice, but the state agencies are mandated to use a statewide contract, right? Okay. So when they're looking for, to find this, uh, this job or whatever, they have to go here first submit it to this first, then they can put it on MRSC or can it be on both at the same time? I'm just, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm just a little bit confused, but yeah, it if they're getting submitted everywhere, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have yeah, to keep looking into I, it. Yeah, it doesn't. Go ahead, Shana. I totally get confusion. So at Department of Enterprise Services, we actually have two sides of the house. One side of the house is where I'm at, goods and services, and we do these statewide contracts that don't fall within public works projects. And that's, that's, there's not a thick, hard line there, so it, it is confusing. Um, on the other side of our house, we have a public works side of the house where we procure and manage all public works projects for all state agencies and community colleges. We don't do transportation projects, that's washed up. Um, so um, that's the other side of the Department of Enterprise side um, that does public works and they're, they operate under like a different statutory authority and public works is defined as a certain way, um, you know, moving dirt, building walls and, and that sort of stuff. So like I said, there's not a thick, hard line, which is why um, Tim City mentioned um, also registering with MRSC because if our public works side of the house has a project that they say, oh, this is public works, they will be the ones going to the MRSC list for um, their small projects. I hope that provided some clarification. Yeah, yeah, that helps. That helps. Um, okay, yeah. Thank you. Oh, great. And um, Donna asked about we're a laser cleaning company, which is neither paint nor pressure washing. So which category do you bid on? And my recommendation is to take that directly to the DES contract specialist and, and see if they can um, 
inform that question or and or add a third category for other methodologies. They might not have realized there was a, another way. Did I hear somebody unmute and ask a question that I interrupted? I have a question about um, establishing what the prevailing wage is. Um, is that something that an Apex consultant can help us with? Because uh, we currently aren't using a prevailing wage. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to just share my screen. Um, and I'm not going to answer it now because it, it is quite quite complicated. But I want to yep. mention that Exhibit D indicates that this contract is subject to Washington's prevailing wage on Public Works Act RCW 3912. And okay. so um, L and I will very much treat it like a public works and thou shall pay the correct prevailing wages. And it depends on the location of where the services is being performed and the type of labor that's being performed. So painting, for example, is there's a couple of paint prevailing wages. There's one for residential and there's one for non-residential. And so you would wanna make sure that, that you are using the exact right one. Um, and typically that burden is on the agency when they award you a contract, they will tell you what, you know, which, which wage category, but sometimes they don't. Um, but either way, you have to make sure with LNI that you are on the same page with LNI requirements. We've had firms that took, uh, that didn't do it right. And, and LNI was very quick to um, ask them to go back and pay back wages plus fines, which could be really expensive. So um, there, there also is a, a wage, a prevailing wage training that LNI requires of public works contractors that we would, that in order to get on the MRC roster, you have to take. So we could direct you to that too, but then we can also work with you on the LNI system and show you how to find all that information. We currently are prevailing, uh, paying prevailing wage on another contract of ours um, through the city of Seattle SPU. Uh, mm -hmm. So we do have experience paying prevailing wage and our accounting department is very familiar with that, but okay, um, okay. it's just not something that we're doing with graffiti currently. So, okay, great. Yeah. And, and if I'm, I guess um, one thing to look out for on the pricing sheet, it, it showed, we have time for this one. Oh, we got one minute. We got so much time. Check this out. Yeah. Check this out. So on the on the pricing sheet, if we look by, um, it says painting painters dash labor prevailing wage plus percent. And so I actually would encourage you to ask the contracting officer to clarify which prevailing wage needs to go in there and why it needs That's to go right. in there at all. Yeah. It's gonna it's gonna change, first of all, by the time this gets awarded and the first task order comes in. And we don't know if it's residential or not. So um I would I would recommend somebody ask that question and see if she can't uncover that during the pre-bid session. Great question for pre-bid, yeah. yeah. And with that, we are officially out of time. So thank you so much for coming. Lisa and I can stay on for a few minutes if you have any other burning questions, but I uh, appreciate your attention and coming today. And we look forward to working with you on this one to help you move forward and be successful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Nice to meet you.